You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Silver Screen Science. Woohoo! This is our series where we talk about the science in movies, particularly movies that overlap with our particular science of choice. This month on Silver Screen Science, we are tackling a theme that our audience has been asking for for a long time. Yes, they have. Crocs and snakes, which get so much attention in the main series podcast, but have gotten so little attention on Silver Screen Science. Yeah, we haven't we haven't really dealt with them in many of the movies. To that end, this June we will be doing a Silver Screen Science double feature of Lake Placid and Anaconda. Yeah. This episode we are discussing Lake Placid. This is a 1999 movie produced by Fox 2000 Pictures and Stan Winston Studios. Stan Winston of Jurassic Park fame, among other things. Yeah, good at making big archosaurs. And directed by Steve Miner. As a reminder, when we do Silver Screen Science, the whole point is to discuss the science in movies, not just the nitpicky, what they do right, what they do wrong stuff, until the end of the discussion, Mm -hmm. but how do they portray scientific concepts, and how do they portray scientists? Where does the movie fall in that grand intersection of science and pop culture? Yeah, scientific representation. Indeed. Now... We're going to get into the science of the film, but first, this is your official spoiler warning. If you have not seen Lake Placid and you care about knowing what happens in Lake Placid before seeing it, we will be discussing the whole movie. Yes, in detail. We're going to talk about the beginning, the middle, the end, the whole thing, so turn back now if you don't want to hear that. Will, before we get into our discussion of the movie, would you like to give us a brief synopsis of what this film is about? Absolutely. Absolutely. Lake Placid, on the surface, seems like your standard creature feature film with some interesting things mixed in. It is a film about a lake in Maine that somehow has gotten a crocodile in it. Right, which is not called Lake Placid. Which is not called Lake Placid. They specify in the movie. The is Black Lake. (laughs) And after an attack, investigators from the Sheriff's Department, Fish and Wildlife, and a museum in New York. Some museum in New York. Some museum in New York are sent there to investigate what happened and come to the conclusion of, yes, there's a crocodile here that is unnaturally large, and the movie is about them dealing with this huge crocodile in a lake in Maine. And and a film ensues. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so in episodes of Silver Screen Science, we typically like to break down our discussion into discussions of the creatures, because that is so often why we pick the movies that we do. Yep. The science, the scientific concepts, and the scientists. So let's start with, I I say creatures plural, but really, but mostly we are talking about the reason this movie exists, the big croc. Yes, that is the main featured animal. There's lots of little forest wildlife cameos. There's a moose. Well, there's part of a moose. We see the front and half back half of a moose yeah. at two different parts of the movie we see a beaver we see a beaver in, a, in its dam we see a turtle there is a turtle uh, some kind of pond turtle yeah and we see a bunch of fish there's a bunch of fish and of course there is a cameo appearance yeah by some kind of snake uh i did not get a close enough look it, it's on the screen for about a half a second it's there for a uh, moment in the movie and that's it it crawls out of a severed head which i take issue with why would a snake probably a water snake Mm -hmm. that's my that's my best shot why would that be inside this wasn't like a skull where it was hanging out no it was like a a rotting corpse head yeah that's not where a snake would hang out it was a weird animal for the have slither out of the animal's mm. mouth mm. or I, out of the corpse's mouth i take issue with his <laughs> representation of snakes well snakes are snakes are creepy and they do creepy things they crawl out of mouths yeah they at, what, whatever the creepiest thing there is to do a snake's probably thinking of doing it <laughs> that's it's it's plotting but there is a crocodile two crocodiles actually that's true uh, well, yeah almost yep <laughs> well, actually there's even more than that there's more than that spoiler warning remember <laughs> <laughs> and it is an indo-pacific crocodile yeah, the they, saltwater crocodile they specify they identify it in the movie which i always appreciated watching this film when i was younger that they do identify it as a specific crocodile and it is the largest species of crocodile that is known for open ocean swimming 
Yeah. Which the movie explains of like, yeah, we have a crocodile here in Maine because it had to have crossed the ocean from Asia. Right. The crocodile in this movie is interesting because, it, you know, so often in when we talk about creatures in film on silver screen science, we come back over and over again to this concept of monsterification. When films take a otherwise normal animal and give it different physical traits, behavioral traits that make it more like a movie monster than like a real animal. Exactly. And this is a case where it th- this is definitely a monsterified creature. It is. It still technically is. But also there are some admirable uh, attempts to also make it kind of like a regular croc. Well, it's not as monsterified as you'd think. Yeah. Especially for what a goofy movie this is. You know, this is a fairly silly, lighthearted film. Right. It, it's got, obviously, it's got a couple of the classics. Mm-hmm. It's super big. It, they state multiple times a 30-foot crocodile. Which is not the size that crocodiles get, at oh. least not today. Largest living specimen ever captured was 20 feet, 3 inches, I think. If, of, if a, it was, of a salty. Of a salty, uh, and it was in the Philippines. Right. On record. Yeah, like that's the biggest there, that there are confirmed captured alive been able to accurately measure it while it was breathing. Right. This, there are stories of bigger crocs, and they in the movie there is a comment. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the biggest one ever was 27 feet long. Which I do think is referring to an actual record of a killed crocodile. But if I remember right, when I read a paper where they were investigating those things, they found the skin or skull and were like, eh, unless this is majorly shrunk or this is the wrong skull, that wasn't a 27 foot crocodile. Right. Uh, I can't remember for sure, but there are actual documented reports like that made it into newspapers, but none of those have ever been scientifically confirmed. Right. So 30 feet is well outside the range of our un- understanding of croc sizes today. Yeah, although the extant species. There absolutely have been crocodilians in the past that were up to 40 feet long. Yeah, so this is not outside the range of size for crocs, right. just for the ones we have around today. Uh, but it's big it's big it and it's doing my favorite Mm -hmm. thing and that it it's got the monster noises it does it makes a lot of noises not all of its noises are out of the question Mm -mm. like it's doing some of the bellowing yeah sort of the rumbly bellow of crocs but it's also opening its mouth and roaring (laughs) there are a couple moments where it's like maybe maybe if i stretched i could think i could give there a reason for that to still be a croc noise but no that's pretty much just a Big cat roar. Right. You, you did. Ju- there is one part. I don't remember which part this was where it makes a sound that is almost too similar to the Jurassic Park T-Rex. Yes. Where yep. it's almost a screech. Mm-hmm. It, it's got that almost screechy quality of that. Yeah. There are a few cases in here where they do the classic. Yeah. We're going to give you a monster roar to make it scarier. There's one moment where it's its presence is revealed before it's shown with its breath. And oh, I, yeah. I always remember like. Every time I've watched it and it gets that scene, the thought pops in my head of, I don't think I've ever had a reptile breathe that hard. Yeah, cool. Well, because it's doing, again, the T-Rex thing. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Yep. (sighs) Yeah. Which, yeah, creepy for a movie, but yeah, probably not a noise that they're making. I I mean, I've never, (laughs) I've never heard an alligator breathe to the point that you can hear it. Right. Uh, that just seems like more of a mammal thing to huff. Yeah. But other than those and a couple of moments of like hyper aggression, mm-hmm. uh, especially during the climax. Yeah. It's not overly ridiculous. There are a bunch of things that it does that are pre- pretty decent. You know, they talk about uh, when they're trying to shoot it mm-hmm. at one point, they, they say uh, Bill Pullman says aim for the belly or the sides yeah because its back is armored which yeah it is a monstery thing to do in movies to make things impervious to damage but this croc follows relatively realistic croc physics well it's i love there's one moment when the the croc enthusiast who we'll mention later is close to potentially being attacked and a deputy brings out her gun to be like right, i'm gonna shoot it and he goes no you you might not penetrate its hide yeah. And it's, yeah, because she, she's using a handgun. Yeah, it's a pistol. And it's like, yeah, that there are crocs known to have bullet scars from 
light arms fire yeah that are just still swimming around probably with the bullets still lodged inside them because it's a crocodile it spends a lot of the movie hidden underwater mm-hmm. which of is is a great trait for your movie monster but is also a thing crocs do and because they chose indo-pacific's estuarian crocodiles the saltwater crocodile has a lot of names because it covers multiple countries yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> you also have I, and they never mention it in the film but if they happen to if they were aware of this then they used it thoroughly they are one of the few truly aggressively territorial mm. crocs known for dis- territorial displays and attacks that are not feeding attacks. You're a, a big animal that's in my territory. You might be a rival. I'm going to kill you. Right. It's like they are known for those things. There are stories of saltwater crocodiles in Australia chasing people up trees and then staking out under the trees for hours. Yeah. Like this is a crocodile who is known for their aggressive tendencies, who do see people as on the menu and are territorial territorially defensive yeah so like a moment when they get flipped out of a canoe while the degree that the canoe flips is a bit hulkish yeah (laughs) i've watched a video of a person knocked over in a kayak by an alligator yeah that's a thing that they'll do sometimes (laughs) got too close to a nest and the mother just charges them and knocks them over they get away fine because that was just to make a point but this could a lot of the behavior in the movie could very much be listen you people are spending a lot of time in my lake and i'm not enjoying it so i'm going to make a point of it by attacking you the most monstery that it gets in in classic monstery fashion is during the climax yes where it shoves itself through a helicopter and it chases a truck onto land yeah it goes up onto land and it's like wheeling around and trying to roar at everything so they definitely this this creature is an interesting meld of monstery traits and actual just being a crocodile Which is interesting because it goes to the point that we have made uh, in the past that uh, crocodiles are an animal that you don't actually need to monsterify for a movie. You just need, all they really did was ramp up some of the behaviors. Yeah, make it bigger. A bit, make it bigger, make some of the aggressive a little more aggressive, make its appetite a little more. But no, like it taking down a cow is not like, that's no. ridiculous. No, they take down cows. <laughs> the, one of the things that struck me the most in this movie, in terms of monsterification, because I don't think we've ever talked about this before, there are moments in the film where there are, you know, dramatic moments and moments that are meant to be intense or scary because of what the croc is doing, which seem to me to actually be less intense Mm -hmm. than what a croc would actually do. So, for example, there are a couple points in the movie where the croc bites off part of a person. Yeah, just like cleanly. There is a... I I don't know if the movie wanted this moment to be scary or hilarious. (laughs) I, I didn't find it the former... Where a guy gets his head bit off. It just perfectly and it's just right at the shoulders. Clean. Boop. There's also a Jaws moment in the beginning where a guy's getting dragged. You know, he, part of him is above the water and he's being attacked by something yeah, underneath the water. being pushed through the water as he's screaming. Right. And I would watch these moments and I'd be thinking to myself, you know, in a real life croc attack would be way scarier than this because the people would just disappear. Yeah. Well, and it's also one of those like, Every time I see moments like that in a movie where the person is upright in the water but being pushed through the water. All right, well, that means that the crocodile is swimming sideways. Yes, which we see it do later in the movie. We do, but it's like (laughs) that that means it's swimming sideways. And if it's that close to the surface, we should see like its arms. Like physically, it doesn't make sense (laughs) for the croc to be positioning the person slightly out of the water while it's in its mouth. Right. It's a little... it looks good above the surface, would be very silly below the surface. Yes. There's also a few moments in the film where the croc is like right up on the surface, stalking, has got its head up there. And at least a couple of those moments, I was thinking to myself, you know, in all, in real life croc hunting, you often don't see it. Which one thing I did appreciate about one of the scenes where it, it has its fully, its body exposed as it's approaching one of the characters in the water. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, once again, I don't know that this is what they were thinking in the, uh, making the film. Right. But that is something Crocs will do when displaying. 
Right. I'm going to expose my whole body. So you can see how big and scary I am. This, this, I'm not trying to hide. I'm trying to show you this is my lake. Yeah. 30 feet. <laughs> my lake. So, like, there are some moments where you could be excused that it is displaying. Also, it's a croc that's being fed. That's true. It is, it's not domesticated, but no, it is but a little bit accustomed to human care. It does not need to hide the hunt usually because no, it's, it's being... Be- Betty White is feeding it. Yes, yeah, she's feeding it <laughs> cows on the regular. And I've seen that happen. We were approached by an alligator in South Carolina. We sure were. That was a good, like, at least 10 footer, swam right over to the edge where we were. We were up on a bank, so we were safe. Yep. But swam right over and then just sat there on the surface for a little bit. Hopped up. Hoping we were going to throw food to it almost surely because mm. otherwise why would it have done that because people are bad and shouldn't do that. Yeah, don't feed wildlife. Leave wildlife alone. Don't touch them. Don't feed them. Don't pet them. <laughs> but I thought it was interesting that there are at least a few moments in this movie that I thought this would be more intense or more scary if it were acting more like a real croc. Yeah. Because you wouldn't have anything left of that person. Yeah, exactly. Or because you wouldn't have seen it approach. Which I think is a really interesting aspect of monsterification. Where the whole idea of monsterification is making something act more like a movie monster. And movie monsters are dramatic. And I had not really thought much about the fact that monsterification can in some cases make something less intense and scary than it might actually be because it's not as cinematic. Well, it's like uh, the the film Blackwater, which I'm sure I've mentioned at some point. Oh, I'm sure. Before. That's Will's go-to example of a good croc movie. This is my favorite example of a croc movie that is just about a croc. Uh, it's still dramatic. The croc does all the things it possibly could do to be scary, but they're all very much in the realm of possibility. And when I've shown this film to people, very often their reaction is like, well, that was kind of disturbing, and a little dark. It's like, well, yeah, because that's what it would be like to be stuck in the territory of a big saltwater crocodile. Yeah, it wouldn't be action-packed and cinematic. It would be r- really traumatic. A war of attrition. <laughs> and, yeah, th- it's a very good film. It's a very good suspense thriller. But it is not... You don't feel pumped by the end. No, it's You're like, intense. All right. Well, we all made it through. <laughs> yeah. And we, we and most of the main characters have <laughs> done okay. And the, yeah, that's this that kind of drives that point home of an actual like I've read reports of actual like traumatic rock encounters and they're horrifying. Yeah. Uh cuz yeah, that's a predator that's <laughs> that's not messing around to be dramatic. No. So we've got our main critter, our featured creature of this creature feature film. No, oh, that's why they call it that. Yeah, that's what it is. Let's talk a bit about the science of the movie. And by the science, we mean the broader scientific concepts, which in this movie are mostly concerning crocodiles. Yes. Yeah, there's lots of croc facts thrown out. And it brings up probably the biggest sort of sciency snag that this movie hits is that there is a giant crocodile in Maine. Now, I know that we have international listeners. Yes. So if you aren't familiar with the layout of the United States, the state of Maine is the northernmost extent of the eastern coastline of the of the of the the mainland of the United States. Practically Canada. Basically Canada. And yeah, this is it's a weird it's a weird place to set a croc movie, which is very much the point from a filmmaking perspective. And is, they say it in the movie. Yeah, they all everyone in the movie is like, "Hey, you might have a crocodile." And everyone in Maine's like, "No, no we, we don't have yeah. a crocodile." Here in the real world, crocodiles get on, on at least the East Coast as far north as North Carolina. Well, so maybe? No, uh, so for here alligators get that far. Oh, the uh, crocodilians, I yeah, should say. Yeah, crocodilians. Yes. And that's because the American alligator is very cold tolerant. They, yes. That is what they do best. Actual crocodiles only get up to the southern tip of Florida. Right. And saltwater crocodiles are predominantly southern hemisphere. Yeah, well, they, they make it they? into the northern, but like still all around the the equator. Right. Because they make it up into the Philippines and uh, I do believe they range to India. But these uh, are tropical, very tropical. subtropical animals. And all crocodiles are. There's no cold weather crocodiles. So uh, yep. the two alligators get into colder areas. Crocodiles don't. Caimans don't. Right. So yeah, it totally out of the norm to find a croc today in Maine. 
but I actually almost appreciate the fact that the movie is, treats it as it's ridiculous. Like all the characters are like, yeah, this is super weird. This shouldn't be what's happening. And there's not even anyone who really brushes it off there. You know, when they finally do confirm it's a croc, they're like, so why is it here? I, I don't know. Yeah. And they p- put out some relatively real world explanation, you know, suggested explanations. Oliver Platt's character points out that there these crocs are known to cross oceans. Yep, like they are salt water tolerant. They can go out into open ocean and have been found miles away from land. I think he's also the one that points out that as long as their nostrils can be above the water, they can survive in a freezing lake. Which is an alligator reference. Right, alligators here in North America do that. At the very least, maybe the Chinese alligators do Yeah, I well. don't know about Chinese. I don't know how much freezing their area gets uh, into, but... But North American alligators can survive freezing lakes. But once again, alligators. Right. And also not Maine freezing. No. But like the Carolinas freezing. Yes. That's still as far north as they go. But Maine freezes a lot longer and than those places do. There's a reason crocodiles don't range north farther than the Florida area. Because it starts getting too cold for them too quickly. Like right. alligators are really good at cold weather for crocodilians. Yeah. But they do also throw out a number of other crocodile factoids. Some of them are a bit generalized. Some of them are, like, every now and then they'll throw out uh, facts that might also be kind of jokes. So, like, right. they're kind of, blur- like, they talk about them being attracted to noises. And it's like, all right, I mean. And, and also, there's a point where he says uh, uh, it, it goes after anything that moves. Yep. Which is another one of our monstery traits we've talked about. And it's something that hasn't been established previously. They, they just threw that out there to explain the plot, of, the, the plan for the climax. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, they have a couple of moments like that. But they do throw out a number of others where they, yeah, they, uh, one of the characters, one of the people from Maine who are not familiar with, familiar with crocodiles are like, it, it can't have gotten here. They don't go into salt water. And the croc expert is like, yeah, okay, well, we'll just keep that secret between us. Yes. Uh, it <laughs> completely makes fun of them because that's a common misconception, but yeah. it's absolutely not true. Yeah, they do go into salt water. And so they make points like that every now and then that are actually not too bad. They use a baby, a speaker with baby croc noises to yeah. try to attract it. Which absolutely is a fairly sensible thing to do it's one of those where if if it's a female it could be attracted protectively males potentially there have been some studies that have found males participating in childcare. right at the very least they might want to eat them but yeah if it's a male it also would be like ooh, f- babies for food delicious so yeah that's a reasonable thing to try to use to attract them they put in an underwater speaker which is not where they're doing their chirping so that's Right, probably like all the not. way to the bottom of the lake. Yeah, that's is... probably not actually going to be <laughs> practical. You know, doing it above ground near a trap would have been better. But their croc science is not too shabby. Overall, not too shabby. There is a, a brief mention of the croc being 150 years old. Yeah. They... Which I assume is a reference to the common misconception that crocs keep growing their whole life and just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, that they have indeterminate growth, that they never truly stop growing. Uh, this also couples with the idea that they are they don't experience senescence, that they right. don't the... age and die. Right, they, they get older and older until something kills them. Mm-hmm. And while those two are not true, uh, at least not in the way they're presented no an older croc will not necessarily just be bigger than a younger croc they do as you've explained on the podcast they'll put on weight as they get bigger but they're not like gaining feet you know year by year by year they it slows down to such a degree at their older age that they're effectively practically not growing and it has more to do with the life they're living than like if an underfed croc is going to be much smaller that's what indeterminate growth really means, is that you're not <laughs> growing at a continuous, regular rate. You're growing depending, determining, you know, determinant right. on what you're getting. But crocs do live about as long as we do when given health care and regular food. Like, they can oh, yeah. hit their 80s and 90s, and 100-year-old crocs, I don't know that there's ever been, like, we have raised this 100 years, but crocs that indicate they are almost or over a century old have been noted. Yeah. So, like that's not completely out of the realm of possibility. It so it could be an old big croc. Yeah, a 150-year-old croc is not as ridiculous as it sounds right <laughs> on the face of it. It's still extremely old for a crocodile. Right. But they at least try to attempt to explain why it's 30 feet. 
you know, they even has a point where someone's like, is it a mutant? And they're like, no, right. right. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's not a, that it's not that that's silly. It's just a very big crocodile. Now, here's the thing that I thought I, I thought to mention after we watched it, but I'll mention it now. I noticed in one shot, you can see its front teeth on its lower jaw are protruding forward, which is a trait that we see in captive crocodiles. Yeah, good and point. I, I'm sure they didn't do that on purpose. Like, I, I doubt that they thought about it at all. But yeah, when you uh, it's a thing that as paleontologists who have studied skeletons, you have to be aware of that mm-hmm. captivity can change a skeleton. And in crocs, often the teeth at the front of the lower jaw, instead of pointing upward like they do in wild crocs, in captive crocs, they'll end up pointing more forward. Yeah, they'll splay out like a, like a, if you take your fingers on your hand and open them outward flat, that's kind of what the teeth will start doing. Which makes me wonder if the artists who designed the croc for the movie had studied captive crocs and based it on that. That's a very good point. Uh, they do also have some f- fun things like they made an animatronic croc and you get some close ups on the jaws and there are the pressure sensitive pits oh, yeah. along the teeth, which I very much appreciate. Like the attention to detail on the croc is f- pretty good. They There's... mention its nictitating membrane. They do. That's true. Yeah, they sure do. Outside of pure croc science, there's not a whole lot of other science. Not hardcore con- science. Conceptually that gets mentioned. There is a subtle theme of wildlife management mm-hmm. uh, in uh, there's a Betty White's feeding the crocodile. Yep. And it starts killing people. Don't feed the wildlife. Which is exactly why, like when we say don't feed wildlife, it's not because you're likely to get attacked, but you are teaching that animal to approach people yes. and who could get attacked. In the movie. And they, they straight up call her out for it. Yeah. Yeah. At least three people die in this movie because you acclimated this croc to people's presence. Exactly. That theme also ends up coming up a little bit at the end of the movie in terms of like capture and then rehabilitation of a croc, which it it takes a surprising turn at the end where the goal doesn't end up being to just murder the croc. And indeed there's a standoff where they're trying to decide well, what do we, you know, do we kill it? Do we, you know, try to get it uh, brought to down to Florida is where they're going to send it to be raised and taken care of because it's just a crock in the wrong place. Yeah. Well, and, it, and it's it's interesting because they have a bit of a philosophical debate about the merits or what the main priority is here. You know, this this crocodile has killed people. So, yeah, and it's an invasive it's animal invasive. in this area. It's big and will be hard to manage. Yeah. So, like, the the arguments for killing it are both it's dangerous, actively so, and is unwieldy. Yeah. But then they also have Betty White, who kept the crocodile a secret because she was afraid people would kill it. Yep. Which they immediately, that's their first yeah. response. And as she said, and it seems that that's exactly what you're trying to do. Yep. But then the characters making the point that this is a anomaly of nature. Like, yeah. this is a giant crocodile in Maine. Oliver Platt calls it a miracle. Like, it really would be a shame to just murder it as soon as we discover it. Yeah, they have the same uh, debate that they have in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Uh, and they make the same decision uh, given the two choices, which in this case turns out to be the right one. Yes, which in this case it's not dumb yep. and contrived. <laughs> And so I, I love that this film also has that. It, it is a creature feature, but it deals with the fact that this is a creature feature, not a monster movie. Mm-hmm. It's just an animal. It's a big animal, but it's just an animal. Yeah, and it's a bit monsterified, but they put in some effort to bring in some real croc stuff. Yeah. Another sciencey thing that comes up very briefly is there's the mention of it as a keystone species. Yes. That it is an animal that when it is in your habitat, it affects the rest of the ecosystem. Yeah, that this is a, a uh, not ecosystem engineer like we, you know, we call beavers and stuff that you're literally right. reshaping the ecosystem. But that when you have certain animals in a habitat, you affect every level of the food chain because you're eating so much food and then you're producing so much poop. And then you're yep. like... You're also, when you die, you affect things. You, you are a major aspect just because of how much of an effect you have on everything that lives around you. Yeah. Incidentally, uh, this movie, there are beavers in this lake mm-hmm. and there is the big croc. And I have been told recently by an expert in these things that in the real world, crocodilians and beavers don't overlap. No. In natural ecosystems. 
partially perhaps because they are well adapted to different regions, but also because that's a real conflict. I, I would assume that if we if we got things warm enough for crocs to start moving into, you know, gators to start moving into beaver territory, and the beavers did not also migrate north out of their territory mm-hmm. to continue following the warming trend, yeah, you're that's just a nightmare for the beaver. Yeah. Uh, we have now you've now made your lake perfect for beavers and even more perfect for alligators. Yeah. And now you have this thing that's just waiting in your home. <laughs> yeah, you've made your bed and there's a there's an alligator. Yep, and you made it for the alligator <laughs> and you didn't realize it. So we've got our critters, we've got our science concepts, and then this movie's got a bunch of scientist mm-hmm. characters, which of course we love to discuss on Silver Screen Science because it's interesting to see how movies portray scientists. First and foremost, of course, there is a paleontologist in this movie. Inexplicably, both like it is surprising that she's in the film and no one else understands why she's in the film either. Even her. Yep. No one in this, everyone's like, why is a paleontologist in this movie? Someone who was making this movie went, I like dinosaurs. Well, (laughs) it strikes me as they wanted to get across this idea of, oh, a a prehistoric terror of the croc. But then the movie doesn't actually go down that line at all. It doesn't really pay off the fact (laughs) that she's a paleontologist. So we are introduced to Kelly uh, at some museum in New York as they describe the American Museum one of, of Natural History. And one, one, it, one, it was one or the other. Which is p- perhaps second only to the Smithsonian in this country, if not this hemisphere, <laughs> to like big influential museums. But uh, these people haven't been to museums. They're from Maine. <laughs> they don't know. With apologies to all of our listeners from Maine. No, yeah, they do not represent your state. Like they, they Or at least no. she does not represent your state favorably <laughs> no one in this movie represents anybody in no, the real world favorably no uh but it, it it's a very <laughs> it, it like uh for like tourism industry wise very pretty that's true it is very pretty yeah. it is i like your i like your big crocodiles yep uh lake placid is Maine's lord of the rings <laughs> 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 at least for me so she sciencey while like she's a scientist technically but she doesn't t- t- do a whole lot of sciencing in the movie she's mostly there to scream when the croc does stuff and to t- feel emotions for other characters because no one else in the movie is feeling emotions about oh, yes. much no things. everyone else either has no <laughs> m- emotions or completely inverse emotions and yeah she's a paleontologist and we see her doing paleontology at the beginning of the film when we're introduced she's to her. cleaning some fossils. Yep, she's working on a, a display, a fossil display in like the main mm-hmm. area, exhibit hall. But then once she goes to Maine, she's sent there to identify a shard of a tooth found with the first victim. Yeah. That someone said looked prehistoric. Which is a thing that paleontologists can attest. We are very often sent pictures and reports from people going, I found this tooth or bone. Yep. What do you think it is? They're just not usually associated with a body. Right. Uh, they're not usually Yeah, we're not usually in a corpse. In. We don't go to the morgue. No. Uh, which she does respond to that way. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's very funny because the, the her whole story is you are a paleontologist who works in the museum, not out in the field. Nope. And you are being sent to Maine to look at a tooth and then get wrapped up in a hunt for a big crocodile. And... That doesn't make any sense. And the way the movie makes it make sense is that it's personal drama. Yes. That sent that actually caused it. And it it and that's un irrational and not logical, and no one in the movie thinks it makes sense either. Yes, everyone else is like, So why are you here? <laughs> So the movie goes, Yeah, you don't belong here, and then we just go on with the movie. Yeah. <laughs> so scientist wise, I mean she's not the most flattering representation of a paleontologist well i think the main (laughs) issue with her as a a scientist in the film is we establish her as a scientist up front we see her doing some science we do have she does get to have a a moment of of scientific explanation when she first gets there yeah she helps identify the tooth she's also the one that identifies the croc yes exactly she identifies the croc based on its scale pattern which is a way that we identify crocs she says it's because it has oval scales which is not how we identify based on the scales right but the pattern of osteoderms around the head and neck is indeed a way to identify, so they were close. 
But other than that, she talks about like knowing Crocs and she is familiar with the Croc expert. Right. So she has some, you know, experience or partial expertise on Crocs, but we don't actually get to see her share much of that or apply much of it during the film. Yeah. Uh, her character does get kind of sidelined to what you were saying of mostly reacting to the events of the film right. than actually participating in uncovering the mystery. Now, I can see some people out there also taking issue with the fact that she's a paleontologist who hates being outside and doesn't like, you know, bugs or getting yes. or camping or anything like that. But I will uh, actually stake a defense here. There, uh, you can be a paleontologist and not like camping. I don't like camping. <laughs> <laughs> you can be a lab paleontologist and not do a lot of field work. That part is fine. Yeah, not all paleontologists get started out as rugged in the woods biologists. <laughs> right, as getting digging in the dirt. Yeah, that does. That's not how it <laughs> always starts. So you absolutely can be a indoorsy pa- paleontologist. Besides her, we've also got Bill Pullman, who is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife guy, yep. I think, or or whatever the wildlife yeah. Yeah, he's, representative. Yeah, he's Fish and Wildlife for Maine, and they they have multiple times where they're calling the federal Fish and Wildlife, so he's right. local Fish and Wildlife. And then we've got Oliver Platt's character, Hector, yep. who is the movie's croc expert, despite being, as they describe it, a mythology professor. Yeah, he's a, 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 a an expert in mythology who is obsessed with Crocs because of all the myths and human religions that have centered around Crocs throughout the ages. Which the movie leans very heavily into, uh, to a point that I can't really comment on it. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of conversation to be had about archaeological or uh, anthropological discussion on human Croc religious interaction that, yeah, we don't actually, we can't really speak to. We'll have to look into it. Yep. There are, like, they do mention some religions that I am aware of just from my... Right. Egyptian, Mm -hmm. obviously, crocs were worked into the mythology. I know that there are cultures in, I believe, uh, there are African ones outside of Egypt where they scarify their backs, you know, which is kind of like tattooing where you actively create scars to make raised patterns on the skin in the pattern of crocodile osteoderms. Oh, interesting. I know that that's a thing, uh, like... They have been in multiple human civilization religions and ceremonies. So it's an interesting angle to bring in. We've got the wildlife person. We've got a paleontologist who doesn't really belong here. And we've got a mythology professor who also doesn't really belong here, but is a self-made croc expert. Well, yeah, he he's become obsessed with the mythology of crocodiles, which has made him seek out to interact with and visit and swim with every species of crocodile he can. Right. And what I think is interesting in this film is that for the most part, the scientists aren't so science-y that it feels like a direct portrayal of... It doesn't feel like the movie going, this is what a scientist is like. No. No. We've got a paleontologist who mostly does museum work and is a bit out of their depth in this case. (laughs) We've got a professor who has an obsession and has learned a bunch of information much of which is relatively real-world accurate. Yep. Yeah, he's the one that drops most of the croc facts, and for the most part, a bunch of them are pretty good. And with that collective of people, this movie admirably avoids one of the tropes we often see in films like this, of having the scientist who just knows all the things and can do all the things and successfully... uh, figures out all the the solutions to all the problems. Yeah, it's just the person who is unlocking all the mysteries. This feels like a collaborative effort. It it's got that team aspect of different people with different expertises bringing what they can to this uh, effort to this discovery to this undertaking. Yeah, who overlap in some parts of their expertise but mostly don't so they're able to cover more bases yeah the movie doesn't really go all in on that and for the most part they're just being goofy characters in this goofy movie but it 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 is more like that than it is like the typical tropey scientists well it's uh uh, you saying that this isn't really movie trying to show this is a scientist i think is most telling by the fact that none of our experts are really in this situation for their expertise their actual expertise yeah like 
She's not studying an extinct species. No. He's not studying mythology. <laughs> no. And Bill Pullman did what did not ever expect to have to deal with a crocodile. He's not dealing with Maine fish and wildlife. <laughs> right. So everyone's in over their head. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's it they have an interesting list of experts that are not poorly represented. Like none of them feel like at no point does one of them say something just so egregious of like ugh, that's an embarrassing thing to have your paleontologist character say. Right. Like, she doesn't say anything that makes me go, ugh. And he even doesn't say anything so supremely stupid, except when he starts getting into, like, the metaphysical aspects of the crocodiles. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, none of them are, like, bad experts. They're just, we don't, aren't shown them as experts particularly. Right. There, there's, a, there, there's a lot of say, pointing at characters and saying, that's a scientist. Yes. Which, I guess, arguably could be a point in the favor of the movie for portraying scientists just as normal people. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah, that's that's exactly the point I was about to make. These are a number of experts who are just mostly people in this film. They're here because of their expertise, but their expertise is not actually super useful in this crazy situation. So now they're just fairly competent people yeah. <laughs> dealing with a 30-foot crocodile, which is almost <laughs> humanizing if they weren't all really big jerks. Right. Also, <laughs> every person in this movie is just a, a huge jerk. That bond through their jerkiness and are all slightly less jerky, at least to each other by the end. <laughs> right. And many of them are entertaining while being big jerks. Yes. Oliver Platt is supremely entertaining. Uh, Mad-Eye Moody, whose name I can't remember off the top of my head at the moment, is very entertaining. And Betty White steals is, the show is entirely betty, is betty white the whole time <laughs> so overall you know that uh, if we were grading movies on their science and scientists this was not too bad actually not as bad as you'd expect it to be for a film about a 30 foot croc in maine right for what is at its essence a big dumb movie but like it has all the setups for just a b movie yeah uh but is actually not that terribly represent yeah. representative of the things it's showing b plus movie yeah it, it definitely <laughs> a good b movie if not maybe rising out to the category of b like for how it's representing stuff not as bad as you'd expect not bad now in our tradition of silver screen science we do not typically spend these episodes nitpicking the little instances of this thing was wrong and this thing bothered me because, A, that's not the interesting part to us. Nope. We like that broader discussion. And B, because that's been done in a lot of other places in a lot of other ways. Yeah, and depending on how technical you want to get, there's it's a film, it's a fake story, there's always something wrong. Right. That said, it is a lot of fun to nitpick sciencey weirdness in movies. Yeah. So, at the end of every Silver Screen Science discussion, we like to give ourselves an opportunity for mini rants. Just a couple of minutes of getting unreasonably upset about some science nonsense in the movie. Will, do you have a mini rant for Lake Placid? I do, and it's about the one animal that I think we might have forgotten to mention when we mentioned oh, the creatures. we did. Which is the bear that shows up. There's a bear. That looks like a grizzly bear. Yes, and some kind of brown bear. It's a, it's a brown bear of some sort, you know, so whatever local name it might have. Mm -hmm. Uh... They call those Bigfoot. Right <laughs> Sasquatch. That's the local name. It's the it's the uh, uh, skunk ape. <laughs> There's a moment where they're the characters uh, are two of them are frustrated with each other and they're running through the woods as they're having a disagreement and they end up on this rock next to the water and they're all shouting at each other and then out of nowhere just out of the woods comes a fairly sized a brown big, bear. Big old bear runs through the group, knocks over one of the characters. Yeah, everyone has to dive out of the way. Charges onto the rock and then stands up and yells at them all. And the reason the bear shows up is so that then, while they're scared of it, the crocodile can show up and eat the bear. Right, the bear can get Samuel L. Jackson by yep. the crocodile. And it can it can be the DBZ moment to be like, oh, you thought the bear was scary. <laughs> right. This is what true power level is. And <laughs> then they're all shocked by the crocodile. But every time I'm like, what was that bear doing? doing like it just charges into this group of people like for apparently no reason they didn't stumble upon the bear you know they didn't come into a clearing and there was a bear and the bear goes oh now you messed up no the bear just charges from somewhere in the woods and it's not even like bears are barely 
mentioned in the film. Like, the word bear is said a couple times. Because someone's like, maybe the guy was killed by a bear. Like, They're like, not in a lake. Earlier in the movie. But there's no lead up to this. It just shows up. Yeah, there's not like they've had moments of like, oh, be careful. Like, tie up the food. There is a yeah. bear in the area. Watch out for bears. And so, yeah, see, I told you. I thought a bear was the guy that killed. It wasn't a bear. Nope, just showed up. Just, and here he is. Hope time for my cameo and it's it just it feels so out of nowhere it's it's not that that's not something a bear might do you know the brown bears are territorial that's i i've heard that it's when a, you know if it's attacked by a brown bear you play dead because it's usually territorial mm-hmm. attacked by a black bear you fight because if you play dead they're just gonna eat you right so so said our <laughs> professor blaine when i asked yes <laughs> So, I mean, it could, they do charge people and get territorial and whatnot, but it just, yeah. it it comes just crashing just, through the underbrush. It just runs through all the people and then turns around and roars at them, in, roaring at them into the direction it came from. Yeah, like, what? what <laughs> this is my rock. You get off of my rock, Hector. <laughs> That's right. You get out of here. This is, I, I'm protecting this crocodile. I, you get off of this. <laughs> That's what it, the bear came in to be like, guys, get away from the water. <laughs> yeah. What are you there's doing a, here? There's a crocodile You're way here. too close. Crock-wise. <laughs> you need to be croc what? And then he gets eaten in the ultimate ironic display of crock-wise behavior. <sighs> if, if, if only our main characters knew, only they could prevent crocodile attacks. Poor Crocky the bear. <sighs> Well, my mini rant uh, is about the paleontologist. Yeah. So this is a moment very early in the movie. As we mentioned, the paleontologist character, Kelly, is brought up to Maine. to I- brought on set. To, yeah, <laughs> into the movie to identify a tooth that was associated with a corpse that uh, we, we see attacked by the croc earlier in the film. And she is identifying the tooth. And she says, this is definitely a reptile and it's not fossil i don't know what it is where did this come from let's get more information i need to see it under a microscope right and she said that and i went "Mm, no Mm -hmm. it's definitely a reptile and it's not a fossil right there reptiles modern reptiles only fall into a few categories (laughs) yeah yep one of which doesn't have teeth nope uh, which also a uh, turtle cameo in the movie <laughs> and the other, the rest of them, lizards and snakes. And then our friends, the two have real tiny little teeth. Yeah. Don't have teeth that will have shards the size of a, the, the width of a pencil. I refuse to believe that you could hand a, even like a bad paleontologist, <laughs> a big crock tooth and they would go, well, this isn't a fossil and it's definitely a reptile. I'm going to need to do more. No, it's a croc. Yeah. Obviously, it's a croc. How do you not know it's a croc? How big are your monitor lizards here in Maine? <laughs> <laughs> well, you got some real monsters up here. <laughs> Oof. Man, these garter snakes are getting crazy. There is only one option for that tooth. To... She, this is like maybe like seven minutes into the movie. Or so. It's way early on. And she said it and I sat sitting in my chair. I went. No, mm, mm. I see what kind of movie this is. Yep, be. yep. Well, that <laughs> that sounds very sciency. Right. Well, and it also again it 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 leans into that theme of like some ancient prehistoric thing that they then completely drop after that scene yeah. and really never bring up again. And it's like <laughs> I I could have appreciated if they had a moment of like I mean that. I, I I see where you guys are coming from. This looks kind of like a crock tooth, but that can't, like that shouldn't. Right. Th- th- where did you find sense. this? This came from a lake here in Maine. All right, so we can rule that out. Yeah, something like that would have would have <laughs> fixed it. Uh, Cause that that's happened. I've been in situations where people are like, "Well, it looks like this, but where did you say it came from?" Yes. All right. Well, then it it shouldn't be that. And then at some points, it, it's either found out the location was wrong. Or sometimes it's like, okay, no, it is that thing, and it was from there, and we were just wrong. Yeah, because someone was feeding an invasive yeah. croc species where it doesn't Because <laughs> Betty White was uh, was, <laughs> was mucking about. Messing up the lake. Well, this, it was, this was a delightful movie to watch together and then to discuss. I had never seen Lake Placid before. This was a first for me. I'd seen it once or twice. <laughs> And overall, a, a, a good movie for silver screen science. Yes. Lots of good stuff to discuss. Thus concludes the first installment of this month's double feature, 
We will return in a, a week after the pub posting of this episode, a little later in June, to discuss Anaconda, which you remember in this one where we talked about how the croc was surprisingly not as monsterified as you might think. Yeah, not too bad. That will not be the case it's in an... the next movie discussion. <laughs> Gonna be the opposite. <laughs> that one I've seen. Oh, have I seen that one. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. Tune in to listen to us discuss the science and scientists, etc. about Anaconda. And hey, if you're a patron and you'd like to hear our personal thoughts of the movie, aside from our sciencey thoughts, head over to Patreon and along with this movie, we will release an episode of More Thoughts, which is where we just talk about our own feelings about the movie. Yeah, where we pretend to be movie critics. Exactly. Yeah, that's what we're building up our repertoire mm. of uh, film criticism. Listen, if half the people on YouTube can do it, we can do it too. Yeah, surely. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, let us wrap up this episode and sometime in the near future, we'll sit down and we'll watch Anaconda. Yeah. And then talk about that. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.